Hello guys and welcome back and today I want to talk to you about something I've been meaning to talk to you about for a little while and that is The Elder Scrolls The Dumbing Down. Right, now before some of you work yourselves up into an adolescent fit of mindless hysteria, I want to preface anything that I say here with a few facts. Fact number one, I've played every single test game that they've been released for the PC. That's seven of the games. Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, Oblivion and Skyrim. And two other games, that is Redguard and Battlespire. Point number two is that I really, really like the Elder Scrolls games an awful lot. And actually, I don't think that Skyrim is a bad game at all. In fact, I think that they've made some very good improvements to the series. Point number three, what I'm going to discuss here is actually symptomatic of modern gaming in general and not exclusively a test issue. However, I will be dealing with specific test issues in this series. And by TESS, I mean The Elder Scrolls. I'll just be saying TESS because it's the acronym and it's easier to say than The Elder Scrolls every time I want to say The Elder Scrolls. Point number four. I will be comparing only the latest three TESS games generally. But the reason for doing this is because with Morrowind to Skyrim, the technologies used are fairly similar and therefore comparable. Right. Do I think The Elder Scrolls have been dumbed down? Well, yes and no. And essentially, this is my main point of this video. Where the games have massively improved in the realm of graphics, physics, NPC AI, etc., the games have been increasingly marketed and developed for more casual gamers and consequently making the games more console friendly. There's two main areas where the Elder Scrolls series have become dumbed down. First, in the constraints of making a multi platform game, and second, and the pursual of more casual players. Now, it's obvious to see why Bethesda, or any company for that matter, would do that. It's because if you appeal to more people, you can make more money. Unfortunately, when you broaden your base, you usually have to appeal to the lowest denominator in order to do so. Now, I don't want to get into or start a pointless PC gamer versus console war. I personally own consoles myself. I have a Wii and I love to play Guitar Hero on it. But let's not delude ourselves. There are no consoles in existence that can come close to the processing and graphical powers of a modern PC. And when I want to get into some serious gaming, there is no substitute for a mouse and a keyboard and 20 times the processing power of any console that currently exists. Now just so we're clear, there are things that you can do with a mouse and keyboard that you simply can't do with a controller. And yes, I know that your console of choice can have a mouse and keyboard attached to it, but that's not what developers build for when they're building a game for your console. They're building for a handful of buttons and a couple of joysticks. And you know this. Again, I'd like to reiterate the point. I'm not making the argument that PCs are better than consoles. It's a little bit like saying cars are better than buses. In what way is a car better than a bus? Consoles have their role, but so do PCs. But in the realm of gaming, I have a few bugbears. In fact, two bugbears. Bugbear number one. The aging nature of the current console technology limits the scope of developers. They're having to build a game around decade-old system specs, but not the machines that us PC gamers have sat on our desks. Bugbear number two. Consoles are designed for casual gameplay, and when games are multi-platform, they are made for the machines with the fewest buttons. And you can really tell when you're playing on a machine like a PC. Again, I'm not making the argument that PC is better than console. Each have a role to play, and as I've already said, I own consoles myself, I even have a Wii, and I love to play Guitar Hero on it. But my point is that consoles have a very noticeable set of limitations and when you make games for these systems you can't help but have to comply to these limitations. Now Bethesda make multi-platform games because they can make more money that way. However developing to certain systems is only part of the problem I see in the dumbing down of the series. The main problem is the specific type of gamer they are aiming to please. Namely the casual gamer the low attention span gamer, the kiddies with no experience or grasp of what an RPG experience really is. Okay, before I go into any details, I want to clarify something. I don't want some of you getting confused. 
Some changes that Bethesda have made to the game fall squarely within the realm of streamlining. Things like removing athletics and acrobatics, or even controversially so the removal of the class system. These things make sense to me and actually even add to the game, even though I love very classic hardcore D&D games. Beth's moving away from dice rolling massively improved the combat system, circumventing the frustrating point-blank misses you would experience in Morrowind. Also, a classless system, to me, makes for a more natural playstyle, rather than a contrived playing to some model of a character invented by some game designer somewhere in a cupboard. Again, there is a lot that Bethesda have done well, and I'm not trying to levy a mindless tirade against them. In fact, I've highlighted in my introduction that they have made improvements, namely the graphics, the physics, the NPC AI, the combat system, and the removal of superfluous elements, among many other things. However, this is the point in the video where I tell you the things that Bethesda have got wrong. Yes, I know, let the full fanboy whines commence. But there's an awful lot of things that I could have covered, which I'm not going to cover. Things such as the reduction in armor slots, the wear and tear and maintenance of equipment being removed, the massive upheaval to the alchemy system, the changes in the skill system, the removal of skills, the off-the-shelf magic system, and the reduced number of spells, the removal of skill-based dialogue, the removal of the attribute system, and are replacing it with merely health, magicka, and stamina points. The perk system. But I'm not going to cover any of these, because although I could make my case using them, they don't necessarily detract from the game per se. But the points I'm going to cover do, and clearly highlight the casualization, or dumbing down, of the test series. So here are the points. Point number one. You can't fail. Point number two. There are no consequences for faction membership. Point number three. Choices you make have little impact on the world. Point number four. Quests and journal systems. Point number five. NPC conversations are heavily reduced. Point number six. Massively oversimplified puzzles. And point number seven. The value of items have been reduced. Now I want to point out that most of the dumbing down of the series happened between Morrowind and Oblivion and not necessarily between Oblivion and Skyrim, although Skyrim did add some of its own dumbing down elements. However, Skyrim actually improved the, the series on Oblivion. In fact, in my opinion, Oblivion is actually the weakest game of the entire series, but <laughs> that's an entire video on its own. Another point that I want to make is when I say dumbed down, I'm invariably saying casualization. Okay, to my first point, you simply can't fail anymore. Today with Skyrim, you can't fail at anything aside from dying. And to be honest, I get the feeling that the game developers seriously considered removing even that. I mean, it'll save the player all those pesky reloads. I mean, who wants to constantly be reloading every time you die when you can be made to feel like a badass? So, a few points where the game doesn't let you fail. First one, important people can't die. In Morrowind, if you were powerful enough, you could wreak some evil kind of genocide on the island of Vardenfell and kill every single thing that lived, leaving every town, village, settlement, cave, ruin and mine barren if you saw chores and had the means to do so. In fact, you could kill even guards, gods and, more importantly, plot characters. You know, it is a special kind of patronizing when a game not only tells you that it's not a good idea to kill such and such, but holds your hand and simply won't let you. This blatant interference with a player's experience is infuriating and gives the game a plastic feel. Morrowind had it right. The game would tell you if you'd killed someone you may find integral later on, but it wouldn't stop you from doing it. Killing has to have consequences outside of a thousand septons bounty or spell in jail. If you want to kill a certain character, then the game shouldn't second guess your choice, whether you have semi-legitimate reasons to do so or you simply can't control yourself. It doesn't matter. Making half the characters in Skyrim and Oblivion immortal is the worst kind of lazy playpen handholding, castrating the player and the game. But reloading all the time sucks. When you kill important characters, that's really boring and sucks then don't kill NPCs indiscriminately or learn to take some responsibility and live with the consequences of your actions or simply reload. It's not difficult. There are already games out there where indiscriminate killing is the name of the game. It's called Call of Duty. Second point on this issue. 
There is nothing that you can say to upset NPCs. In the past, certain NPCs would outright refuse to deal with you if you had previously attacked, insulted, or gone against their wishes in the past. You could, in most cases, work your way back into their graces, however you had to work at it. However, now in Skyrim, you, you simply can't do anything that would jeopardize your ability to interact with them PCs. Again, hand-holding. Again, plastic. Again, dumbing down. The third point on this subject. You cannot fail quests. In Skyrim particularly, quests are structured so that you simply cannot fail them, beyond dying or simply not completing them. Aside from their typical linear nature, a subject, actually, that we'll come back to, quests follow a usual do this, do that, get reward. No chance to betray someone, not that it would matter anyway, because NPCs don't react to your behavior. No chance to completely blow the opportunity that you've got, such as I don't know, capture a rare badger alive, and if you couldn't capture it in the allotted time, then you failed. Or if it dies, then you failed. Welcome to a real RPG, and no, you don't get another try. Right. There are other ways in which you can't lose in Skyrim, but the heavily guided interactions that you have with NPCs and the hand-holding in quests is something that will expand upon. But it aptly demonstrates my point. I see no further reason to labor this specific point, apart from to say, in Skyrim, it is harder to lose than it is to win. Point number two, there are no consequences for faction memberships. In Morrowind, joining or even working for certain factions massively affected your reputation with other factions, whether for better or for worse. This was one of the major things that gave Morrowind its depth and made you feel that this was a living, breathing world. The only thing in Skyrim comparable to this is Stormcloak or Imperial, a mealy mouth appeasement to depth, if ever I did see one. This binary choice emphasized the shallow nature of the game and highlights Bethesda's attempts to appease casual gaming kiddies. Kiddies that don't want their choices of faction to affect anything beyond their eligibility to play the respective faction's quests. An example. In Morrowind, joining the Mages Guild puts you in good standing with a majority of Imperial-based organizations, but it really damaged your standing with House Telvanni a rival mage organization. Further, your standing was affected in a cumulative manner, so further association with imperial-based organizations would disenfranchise you further with more native groups. In fact, after a certain point of affiliation with one of the great houses in Morrowind, it was impossible to do anything further with any of the other rival houses. This added to the replayability of the game and added massively to the depth of the game. Now, in contrast, the Dawnguard DLC for Skyrim really highlighted the dumbing down, baby-faced hand-holding of that game. You were at some point expected to join one side or the other. Again, another binary option. Oh, the ingenuity of it. But Dawnguard was much worse than an inspirationless pick from two options. You could essentially interact with either side as if no side was taken at all, and conveniently along the line you could become a vampire or be cured of vampirism almost at a whim. And what if you were a werewolf, an incompatible creature for contracting vampirism? Never fear, because Bethesda's ever holdy hand is ready to hold yours and grant you a magical cure of lycanthropy. Now why would Bethesda do that for any other reason than because they wanted to avoid rage fits from petty little boys? Lycanthropy, or like vampirism, should be a condition and have factional consequences with large effects. As per the test law, either state is reviled by the citizens of the lands of Tamriel, and vampires in particular have a strong hatred of lycanthropes. So why would Lord Harkon want to bestow his generous gift of pure blood vampirism on a mangy dog animal like a werewolf. Why would he not send it packing back to Dawnguard? Why? Because Bethesda doesn't care about the fidelity to the law, to realistic reactions of their characters, because dumbing down is the order of the day, and having players feel no consequences for their action makes children feel happy. But it neuters the game, and it waters down one of the best RPG series, making it shallow and convenient, like a Happy Meal sat next to Cordon Bleu Cuisine. Skyrim and Oblivion are an ill fit for the test series. Now this is all I say on this particular matter, as I'm sure by now you get my point, and I've already thought of some examples of your own. Point number three. Choices you make have little or no consequence on the world. You know, this is a strange one, as I can't really pin its existence to Bethesda pandering to casual gamers. At least it doesn't seem obvious. It may just be laziness, <laughs> who knows. But let me give you a few examples so we're on the same page. In Skyrim, 
you could kill the Emperor, and then join up with the Imperial Legion afterwards. But the characters make no mention of this. It's weird how those supposedly there to serve the Emperor are so unfazed by his demise. Also, if you complete the Imperial questline and retake, almost single-handedly, Skyrim for the Empire, you are promoted to the rank of Legate. But afterwards, no guards recognize your rank and treat you like a commoner, in fact, threaten you. <laughs> in contrast, even in Oblivion, you were held as a hero of Kavach or acknowledged the Grey Fox, and in Morrowind, NPC reactions would vary massively depending on a whole range of alignments and accomplishments. Again, it is these things that give the series depth and taking them away makes the game painfully shallow. I'm sure you get my point, and because it's more of a side point and generally doesn't tie into my theme of dumbing down for the sake of casual gamers, I won't prolong this section, other than to point out its needlessness and to reiterate it as another example of dumbing down the test series. Point number four. Quests and the journal system. <sighs> oh Boy, this is a bit of a painful one as I'm not sure they ever really got this one correct. Before I go any further, I want to make the distinction that there is a difference between the quest system and the journal system. The quest system is the method used to convey to the player what they need to do and how to do it. The journal system is the method by which quests are recorded and organized for the player to review and manage their activities. They usually go hand in hand and blur a lot around certain features, but it is important for me to make the distinction between them both. In vanilla Morrowind, quests were very difficult to keep track of once you picked up more than three or four simultaneous quests, or if you had a spell of interesting conversations. In fact, the journal system of Morrowind was widely nearly universally criticized. The journal system was designed with realism in mind, basically a book that built up over time, chronicling the progresses, achievements and encounters of the player character. Unfortunately, without any kind of search function or easy list of ongoing or outstanding quests, knowing what you've done and what needs to be done was extremely hard to keep track of. And with hundreds of pages of activity to trawl through, it was nearly impossible. This was, however, addressed in the Tribunal expansion, and players could view all available quests in a convenient list and filter for unfinished quests. This massively improved the game and made it easier to see what you've done and what you need to do. However, they never really quite got there with it. In contrast though, although the journal system was frustrating in Morrowind and essentially a complete disaster, the quest system was engaging and enjoyable. NPCs would explain in detail their requirements or problems and the player would use that information to work out how best to accomplish the aims of the quest. Verbal or written directions were given and players would use their knowledge of the geography of the land of Vardenfell to navigate to where they needed to go. This gave the game another level of depth and led the player to appreciate the landscape and transport links within the game. But then came along Oblivion and its quest markers. Although the game had a solid journal system, the developers stripped out of the series one of its fundamental charms, that being the enjoyment of finding your own way around the world and exploring the land. What did Oblivion substitute this with? Quest markers. Little floaty arrows that magically told your player character where they needed to go. And Skyrim inherited this and took it to a whole new level. Players were transplanted from an RPG exploration adventure game and dropped into a catch the arrow walking simulator. But if you hate having to follow quest markers so much, just turn them off. Don't worry about them. Well, in Skyrim, the journal system is so sparse on details that it is impossible to navigate to an unknown area without the little arrow to point the way. Bethesda essentially gutted the journal and quest system, dumbed it down to such an extent that you simply have to accept that your character knows instinctively where every location of Skyrim is, or where all of the bandits are hiding, or who they should or should not assassinate. And if you do turn the quest markers off, the journal system is so pasty and weak that it won't tell you any directions or specific details of your quest. When playing the game, you can tell, clearly tell, that the developers intended you to spend all your time chasing a little arrow around with no thought to playing the game without it. Now, when I talk about hand-holding, you can't get a clearer example than pointing to exactly where you're meant to go and giving no option to play in any other way. In fact, the only way Bethesda can make it worse is to turn Tess into an on-rails cutscene with intermittent combat whereby we kill the dragon by mashing fervently on the E button. Hmm, actually, you better not give them any ideas. It is sad that this kind of follow-the-arrow system is so common in modern gaming. 
So common in fact that I dare say that some of you won't see an issue with it, or if you do, weren't previously aware of its condescending nature. Now on top of the issues that we've already discussed, this particular issue with the test series is painful because it shows how much towards casualization the game has moved, and how unlikely we are to ever see the kind of test game we all hoped Oblivion and Skyrim would be. The fabled Morrowind 2. We won't see it because Bethesda are looking to make more money and they need casual gamers to do so. Sorry loyal hardcore fans, you helped build the brand but you're of no use to us now. But why don't you console yourselves with some brand new horse armor DLC? I'm not sure if I've articulated this point clear enough but I feel that I've said what needs to be said on this issue. It is in fact one of my pet dislikes of the test series and I don't have the heart to continue. Point number five. NPC conversations are heavily reduced. This is a little point, but it carries on from our last topic of dumbed down quest and journal systems. In Morrowind, conversation with an NPC was generally deep and enthralling. They would give you details of their life, town, tell you rumors, and if they liked you, secrets. It paid to talk to people, and it was exciting to meet new characters and discuss with them on a whole range of subjects, gathering information, tips, and local knowledge. There was a purpose to interacting with everyday citizens of a town or village. It benefited you to make friends and to cultivate alliances with certain people of authority, but not anymore. Lamentably, the wonderful conversations of Morrowind are gone, and so is the depth and personality it brought to the game. What once was is now supplanted with weak and rushed bullet points. To me, there are two reasons for this. The first is the financial constraints of voice acting and Morrowind level of dialogue. And second, unsurprisingly, is the appealing to less engaged, casual gamers. If I'm realistic, I doubt Bethesda would really give us Morrowind level conversation, even if they were willing to spend the budget for voice acting. It certainly would help to bring back some of the depth the series has so woefully lost, but most probably it would lose the attention of Bethesda's largest customer base. Also to clarify, when I say conversations have been reduced, I'm referring not only to the amount an NPC will discuss a given topic, but also to how many topics any given NPC would talk to you about. At least with Oblivion, NPCs had a reasonable amount of topics to discuss, not Morrowind levels, but better than Skyrim. In Skyrim, you got an average four conversation topics with NPCs, sometimes more if they were plot characters, and sometimes invariably so less. This static restricted dialogue imposed on us makes the world noticeably fake. It is jarring and makes the series feel plastic and soulless. Again, another blatant example of the Elder Scrolls being dumbed down. Further, the dumbing down of conversation seems to have gone hand in hand with the simplification of quest lines. Although the various faction quest lines told interesting stories, particularly, I feel, in Skyrim, the developers saw fit to remove any chance that the player could move events in other directions. No ability to double cross or to trick, just an off the rails linear story. They could have done so much more, I mean take Baldur's Gate multi-option quests for outside inspiration. Oh, and if you like RPGs and you don't like in-depth engaging conversations with NPCs that have a personality, you're a little bit of a walking oxymoron. As I said, this is a little point, and I'll let it rest here and move on. Point number six. Massively oversimplified puzzles. The test series has never really been all too heavy on the puzzle front, but when they did have puzzles, they were interesting and engaging, tricky, thought-provoking. In my opinion, Morrowind's puzzles were by far the superior. With puzzles like accessing the Shrine of Vivek in the Puzzle Canal, where players had to drown themselves as part of a ritual based on a cryptic message that read, Breathe the waters of his glory, and the way is made clear. No hand-holding arrows or contrived instructions, the player had to use their brain to work it out. In fact, Morrowind was full of clever little puzzles and riddles, things like the riddling Atronax of Mount Kand Shrine, or something even as relatively mundane as the investigation of the murder of Raelin Harlow. The game would expect you to do your own homework and come back with the answers. This made the game feel satisfying to play and give the world depth. In fact, there were many things in Morrowind that were kept secret and a mystery, but you could uncover them by asking about or reading books. A great example of this was vampirism. You could become a vampire in Morrowind, but it was difficult, and there was no in-game guide to doing so. 
you had to get infected with porphyric haemophilia and survive the encounter with the infecting vampire. Then after 72 hours, you would sleep and awake a vampire. Depending on the clan of vampire that have infected you, your stats would be raised respectively. You could return to the vampire clan that infected you, and they would begrudgingly accept you among them, though any other clan would tear you into tiny little pieces. Living as a vampire granted you super mortal powers and made you a much stronger version of what you once were. But it was a tough existence, and many NPCs would refuse to have anything to do with you. The cure was very hard to both find out about and to accomplish. No NPC knew of the cure and so couldn't tell you about it, although if you were astute, you could read up on the subject and work out via myths and legends what you needed to do. Now forgive me for the brief excursion onto the subject of vampires in Morrowind. I know it doesn't neatly fit into the subject of dumbed down puzzles, but I raise the issue because it highlights the blatant point that in tests now, much less thinking is required to play the game. The intrigue and depth that once was and so loved by the test fans has now been ripped out and replaced by a shallow husk of the intricate world it is meant to represent. Yes, in Morrowind some things were hard and complicated to do, but some things were obvious and mundane. The game rewarded you for snooping about and having a little dig. The tests of today will give you little more than a chest with leveled generic loot. Back onto the subject of puzzles. Oblivion had some nice ones. Not too bad, actually. The retrieval of the shield of the Crusader was a good little puzzle. Not too hand-holding and made you think. But the puzzles of Skyrim... Oh, dear. They are most certainly invented with the very casual of gamers in mind. 99% of all the puzzles in Skyrim can be found in the Nordic ruins and come in the form of either puzzle doors or puzzle pillars. These puzzles wouldn't be too terribly dumbed down and patronizing if they didn't hold your hand quite so tightly and give you the answers right there in plain sight. What is the point in the puzzles if there's nothing to work out? They become little more than speed bumps rather than integral parts of the world and mythos of the land. And by now it should be abundantly clear as to why Bethesda have hacked away at the puzzles in the game. Casual gamers. Right, I think that this point is made, so let's tackle our final point of this video. Point number seven. The value of items have been reduced. When I say the value of items have been reduced, I'm not only talking about the monetary value of items, but also the rarity of them. In Morrowind, Daedric weapons and armor could be found, but they were very rare and usually in the possession of very powerful NPCs. When you finally got your hands on some Daedric stuff, it was a massive success or a massive treat. The same situation could apply to glass armor, though not quite to the extent of Daedric. Also, other special items were tough to find or acquire giving them items an intrinsic worth outside of their monetary value. But don't worry, I will be coming back to discussing monetary value once we're done with rarity. Now, when Oblivion came along, Bethesda tipped the value of items, at least in terms of rarity, out of the window. At high enough levels, the average bandit would be walking around casually sporting full Daedric armor and wielding godly weapons. It was ludicrous. It wasn't just Daedric either. All kinds of rare and exotic items turned up on the corpses of highwaymen and other bottom of the food chain baddies. In fact, this nonsense was one of the most game-breaking elements of Oblivion. Tied to the blasphemous leveling system that Oblivion employed, Gathering rare items and artifacts was no harder than taking a stroll down a country lane. Bethesda acknowledged this horrendous dumbing down, thankfully so, in Skyrim, where higher level items were fairly rare, even at higher levels, and some items were only available via crafting, something you may not be surprised to hear that I have a slight problem with, but not so much of a problem to warrant going into detail here. Now, Although rarity is not at the levels that they were in Morrowind, they still are at an acceptable level, at least to give the world some substance. However, I have a problem with the value of items in terms of monetary values suffering a steady slide to the cheap and affordable. I will grant that in Skyrim you can craft and improve Daedric items up to the point where they're in excess of 26,000 septims, or you could brew up a potion using the alchemy enchant loop exploit that's worth over 60,000 septims. But the base value of most items hovers around the 1,000 to 2,000 mark. This applies to Daedric artifacts even, rare unique items bestowed on the player from Daedric princes themselves. Now these items should be worth a king's ransom. 
not affordable by any old bric-a-brac merchant that you happen to pass in the street. Again, in Morrowind they got it right. Now let's take the example of the cuirass of the Saviour's Hide. In Morrowind it was worth a decent 150,000 septums and gave you 60% magic resistance. By Oblivion its value had dropped to 6,250 septums and give you 25% resist magic. And by the time it turns up in Skyrim, it's worth 2,679 septums and gives you 15% magic resistance and 50 points of resist poison. Between Morrowind and Skyrim, the artifact dropped to 1.8% of the original value, a loss of 98.2% on its original value. Yes, and I can hear some of you now. But what's the point of having items so expensive no one or very few people can afford or even come close to offering a price appropriate to their worth? Well, if you're asking that question, then you're kind of proving my point. Because Bethesda are pandering to those that don't understand that everything of value doesn't necessarily need to be sold. And, if you are going to sell rare and unique items of colossal power, then you shouldn't expect to get anywhere near the true value of the item. By taking these items and stripping back their value to such a level that anyone can buy them off you, the developers are breaking the suspense of disbelief, draining away the depth and quality of the series for no other reason than to satisfy the casual players of the game. Players that want to sell all their Daedric junk and don't want to deal with the inconvenience of not being able to sell things they own at the value the item has. And with that, I feel that my point has been made. I hope that I've made my points as clear and as concise as possible. I want to take this opportunity to say that despite all the aforementioned issues with the test series, I still enjoy playing the games. However, I am sad that there is so much that they can do that I fear we will never see as long as Bethesda continue down the path they are on. Also, just so there's no confusion, I don't think Morrowind is a perfect game, as my highlights of its failings will demonstrate. But Bethesda got a hell of a lot right in that game, and to see all of that face down in a ditch is painful. If I felt there was any hope, I would use this opportunity to plead with Bethesda, to mend its ways and give us the sequel that the Elder Scrolls fans deserve. But I'm not naive. We won't see any change. Because as loud as we shout about this dumbing down of Tess, there is a noise that trumps all of the concerns of fans. And that is the cha-ching of money rolling into bank accounts. As long as making dumbed down casual gamer friendly test simulators is a safer option, that's all we're likely to get. And so in answer to my question, has Tess been dumbed down? Well, yes and no. But mainly, an emphatic yes. Thank you very much for your audience, and I very much appreciate the time that you've taken to spend listening through my arguments. If you have anything to say or comment upon, please feel free to do so. Please try to keep it as courteous and respectful as possible. If you're not subscribed, I would recommend that you do so. I make regular gaming video content, and it may be of interest to you in the future. Also, if you are currently subscribed, Thank you very much for your loyalty, as always. Anyway, guys, that's enough for us today. But when we come back, there'll be more Elder Scrolls stuff. There'll be more game stuff. There'll be more me. But that'll be until then. So until then, guys, stay safe. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. <laughs>